check to see that your ViewMaster interactive vision system is on. If not, slide the green switch to the on position. If it is already on, let the tape play and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another rewind of the retro gaming cassette tape with Replay Retro. Another rewind of the retro gaming cassette tape with Replay Retro. With Replay Retro. Hey, too far, go back. I'm Matt, and on today's show we're continuing to explore the weird and actually kind of wonderful world of video games on VHS as we take a look at the Viewmaster Interactive Vision. Over the last two episodes, we've already taken a look at Worlds of Wonder's light gun based system, the Action Max, as well as Sega and Tyco's racing console, the Video Driver. Both of these systems were an attempt to bring full motion video and real world audio to home video games towards the end of the 8 bit era of chunky pixels and chiptune soundtracks. These consoles relied on footage being streamed from a home video cassette recorder to the TV and used sensors attached to the screen to work out what was going on and score players accordingly. Whilst at first glance this may have seemed graphically impressive and undoubtedly caught the attention of many young gamers, the truth is there was no real interactivity between the player and the on-screen action. Regardless of what they did, the game would continue on the same way every time, and it wasn't even possible to get game over. In fact, you could simply play the tapes in any VCR without the console, and again the action would play out the exact same way. However, there was another option, as earlier toy giant Hasbro had teamed up with video game veteran Nolan Bushnell to work on their own VHS based gaming project codenamed Nemo. Later renamed Control Vision, this system used multi-track VHS tapes buffered by a console attached to the VCR to create interactive movies where the user could move between different scenes throughout the game. Their actions could have real consequences, limiting or granting access to different scenes. The console could also overlay graphics on the screen, adding more stereotypical gameplay elements to the video game background. Thus making the game truly interactive, allowing for a different experience every time, and most importantly for a video game, allowing the player to lose if they just weren't good enough. This technology wasn't cheap, however, as the hardware was pretty complicated. Early prototypes used a modified ColecoVision to generate the overlaid graphics, along with supplementary hardware to interpret video, audio and game data from the VCR, passing through the required scenes to the television, combined with the graphics from the ColecoVision to make one overall output. As a result, the expected retail price was deemed too high to compete, and the project was scrapped despite millions of dollars of investment. However, in the years to come, two of the system's completed games, Sewer Shark and the infamous Sleepover Snuffest Night Trap, would find their way onto the Sega Mega CD, as well as a variety of other formats. In 1988, Viewmaster, the company unsurprisingly responsible for the Viewmaster stereoscopic picture viewer and associated reels covering various tourist attractions, movies and some of the biggest kids entertainment franchises since 1939, decided they wanted a piece of the video game pie. And taking inspiration from the abandoned Control Vision project, they felt that a stripped down version of this system would be financially viable, while still retaining some of the interactivity lost by the Action Max and Video Driver. To simplify things and reduce costs, the Interactive Vision would use just one video track, but have multiple audio tracks set to match the video footage. This meant the system would only have to interpret the data and audio sections of the tape, while the video footage itself would simply be passed straight through to the TV, along with the relevant audio and overlaid graphics generated by the system itself. 
These graphics could be used to augment the video by adding elements, or could be used to hide aspects of the video, giving the illusion of multiple video tracks and greatly increasing the interactivity whilst allowing the games to play differently each time. Little is really known about how the hardware works, though we do know that when run without the console, the cassettes play just one of the audio tracks, and the system itself only interprets sound in mono. This means it isn't simply muting the left or right audio tracks, which would seem the simplest solution. Instead, it's possible it's using some kind of frequency shift, and you can occasionally hear signs of this when the game changes to the secondary audio track. On the video side of things, it's much simpler. The background video comes directly from the cassette, and the console uses the same kind of chip that a regular VCR uses to display an on-screen menu to superimpose its own 8-bit graphics on top of the video, outputting both to the TV in sync to display one complete image. It can even use this to cover up areas of the video, either with graphics or just black screen, to display different sections of the tape based on the player's actions. For example, the top half of the video could be showing a victory animation, while the bottom shows defeat. If the player won the game, then the top half is shown along with the victory audio, while the bottom half is covered by console-generated graphics. If the player loses, then it simply covers the top half instead and plays the losing audio. Game data appears to be contained in strips to the sides of the video frames, which can be seen when the tapes are played without an attached console, though when you're using the console, they're covered by overlaid graphics. On the left, we see some kind of audio waveform, while on the right, barcode-style data is visible at times. Pausing the tape causes the system to lose sync with this data. However, this can be restored by fast-forwarding or rewinding to sections indicated by yellow lines which are displayed just before gameplay segments start. From what little information is available, it would appear that the system launched exclusively in the US late 1988 or early 1989, possibly for around $120, though I've not seen any pricing labels or catalogue information that would confirm this. The system included one game, which was Sesame Street's Learn to Play Together, which introduced users to the console over a series of activities. Five other titles were available at launch, priced at $24.95 each, all using newly recorded footage just for the interactive vision, and all based either on Sesame Street or The Muppets. Some of the titles are undoubtedly edutainment, such as Cartoon Workshop's Oscar's Letter Party, featuring Oscar the Grouch while others are the usual kind of madcap, muppet-based fun you'd expect from a Jim Henson product. Other games were scheduled for release, including titles from giants like Disney, so it's clear the Interactive Vision would have no shortage of material from well-loved children's franchises, giving it a significant advantage over the rival VHS systems. Add in the real interactivity, as well as live-action video and audio, and it's fair to see the system as a potential rival to the dying 8-bit consoles of the era. So, what happened next? We'll find out after we take a look at the hardware and some gameplay. The design of the system itself is quite abstract, with this square section at the bottom made up of smaller squares, and this rectangle at the top at a kind of weird angle with these Lego bumps on top. But I quite like it, it's very different, it has its own unique style. It does look more like a piece of, uh, of concept art or even concept architecture than it does a games console, but it definitely looks very different on the shelf. On top, you can see that these Lego bump style sections are actually air vents to allow good airflow to the system and one of these squares is also the power button, slide that forward and the LED will illuminate to let you know that it's turned on. Nothing else, although you can see that this section here is raised, like a wavy raised section, which leads to what you would assume is a hardwired controller. Well, it is a hardwired lead for the controller, but the controller itself is not actually hardwired and it just runs to this connector, which is a really bizarre way to go. I mean, typically, controllers are either completely hardwired, which we all know is a bad idea, 
or they're removable, but it's the whole lead and the controller which are removable, whereas in this case, the lead is hardwired and the controller is removable from the lead. Which seems a really unusual way to go about doing things, especially because inside the console, this lead is just plugged in to a really standard connector, so it could have easily been a non-hardwired item. No idea why they chose to do that, but that's just the direction that they went in. Over on the side here, you can see there is nothing going on. Same again on the other side. And underneath, exactly as you would expect, you've just got some legs raising it up for a bit more heat protection, screw holes, and the usual embossed information, including the FCC regulations, copyright, and all that usual, usual stuff. Uh, including, of course, do not open. Well, I've obviously had to do that in order to be able to use it in this country, because as you'll see when we get to the back, I've installed an audio video mod. This system normally just outputs its signal via the RF out socket. However, because it was only released in America, it's not compatible with the PAL TV system over here. Our tuners don't go low enough for channels three and four, and so I had to install that to get this to work at all over here. So you can ignore those sockets, but even with those covered, you can see there is a lot going on on the back of this machine. So we'll start over on the left, where you find the audio selector switch with positions one, two, and three. Typically, you keep this switch in the one position. However, in the manual, it does state that if you have any problems with the audio uh, track switching, try it on setting two, then try it on setting three. I have no idea what changes. Maybe it's something to do with the frequency shifting that I mentioned earlier, but I've not had to use it. It seems to work fine. As you'd expect with an American machine, you have a channel three and four selector switch so that you can uh, switch it to the setting which is used the least in your area. So if you have a channel on channel three, you'll switch this to channel four. If you have a channel on channel four, you'll switch this to channel three. Next up, you have the RF out, which is the default output for this machine going to your TV. You have the RF in, which would come from your VCR acting as a pass-through. You have the audio in, which is the audio in from your VCR, transmitting all the audio information from the cassette. And you'll notice that it's a mono audio in, not stereo. And that's how we know that this machine isn't using the left and right stereo tracks to get its different audio tracks. So that was my original uh, uh, thoughts on this. I just assumed that all it was doing was isolating the left and the right audio tracks and only allowing one of them through to the TV, which would of course account for the two available audio tracks. But it's not, this is mono, so it's splitting it differently, which is again why I think there is some kind of frequency shift going on. You've also got video in, so that obviously the video signal is coming from the VCR via RCA as well. Over here you have what looks like a pretty proprietary uh, AC adapter, but actually it's just a Molex connector. Anyone uh, familiar with PC uh, architecture will know that that's an off-the-shelf Molex connector. An interesting way to go, I mean, typically if you're gonna go for an off-the-shelf adapter, you would have gone for a figure eight or a, you know, a kettle plug or something like that, or just any kind of jack pin, really. Again, no idea why they went with that, but then no idea why they went with a lot of design ideas on this machine. Going back to this controller lead, you'll want to know what the controller looks like. And it looks like this, a little bit like a fishing rod, almost, really. Um, you have an awful stiff joystick here, although I will admit it has loosened up quite a bit as I've been playing it, but it's still it's just not very affirmative, it's not very positive. There's no real click other than it hitting the plastic and you really have to hammer it into position to get it to acknowledge your commands. The buttons are a little bit rubberized and they feel quite nice actually. 
they are quite nice tactile rubberized buttons but again you really have to jam them to get them to respond there's no real affirmative click and often when you think you've pressed something it turns out that you haven't of course to attach the controller to the system you simply add this connector on there and then it's attached again no idea why they chose to hardwire the lead and not the controller um, yeah, it just seems a really weird way to do it. But one thing I will say for this controller is if it wasn't for the awkwardness of the joystick and the unpleasantness of the buttons, it's actually quite an easy controller to hold. You simply grip it like I am doing there. Your other hand operates the joystick, which again, if it was a good joystick, wouldn't be bad at all. Your two main fire buttons would be here and you can still get your thumb to the other buttons. So actually, not a bad design. Maybe you could have added a trigger or something here if that was necessary, but unlike a lot of people, I'm not gonna criticize this design of joystick. It looks weird, it is weird, but it's actually really quite ergonomic, really quite comfortable to hold. It's just not very well put together in terms of the buttons and the stick themselves. When it comes to setting up the interactive vision, there's obviously a lot of sockets, a lot of cables, and don't forget, you're not just connecting it to your TV, but you're also connecting it to a VCR. So there's a lot going on. And I imagine that it was probably quite a daunting thing for most parents, especially because video game systems still weren't that common at this time. So a lot of people probably hadn't even set up a basic video game system before. So coming across something like this, would have been pretty daunting and opening the instruction manual probably wouldn't have helped a lot as there are 10 pages of different setup options depending on your setup of TV, VCR and other home entertainment equipment. You can see here that you have configuration option A, configuration option B, configuration option C, configuration option D and configuration, well, a note on stereo spread over two pages. And to make matters even worse, if your VCR didn't have video uh, RCA outputs, you had to get in touch with the Viewmaster Interactive Vision's customer service team in order to get an adapter, which I'm assuming is some kind of demodulator. So, there's a lot going on there. However, it's actually quite simple once you know how it works. First up, you need an RF pass-through so that you can still use your VCR and of course, whatever aerial or cable system is coming into the VCR. So in order to get that, you will connect an RF input from the VCR to the console and that will go in here. You'll screw that on tighter, of course, if you're keeping it in play. You'll then need the RF output, which will go from the console to your TV. This will obviously output the game's picture, but also allow you to have that pass through so you can still use your VCR and whatever is coming into the VCR. You'll then need audio and video RCA cables so that the console can get the video sound and data as it does not use the RF for this. Then obviously you'll need power. And in that situation, you'd be good to go. Of course, as I've already mentioned, mine is AV modded, so I also need to bring in a set of RCA cables to take the video and audio signal from the console to the TV. So we'll just attach those. And then finally, we're good to go. Once you've got all that done, you'll need a game to play. The games come in these standard cardboard slip cases like a lot of VHS cassettes did at the time. 
And it's actually really easy to find these sealed, which is why I've had to ruin the potential VGA grading opportunity by ripping the plastic off to bring you the game. Not that VGA grading is, of course, relevant or something done by intelligent people. Again, it's a standard black VHS cassette with the label for the Viewmaster Interactive and, of course, the game you're playing. And again, any and all copyright information. And when you're ready to play, you simply pop that into the VCR. And switch on the console. Now you'll notice that unlike with other VHS systems, I'm using the cassette here, which is why I'm also using a much better VCR than I was using uh, as demonstration in the others. And the reason I'm actually using the cassette is because of the weird nature that these are set up with, with that multiple audio track and data stream, as far as I'm aware, you can't use a DVD, you can't use a digital stream, you have to use the tape with the way those tracks are recorded. I am going to do a little bit of work to investigate if there are other ways of doing it, but for now, let's take a look at the game. So as you can tell, we are recording from the TV screen, uh, so I apologise for that. However, the interactive vision is problematic to set up and run at the best of times, and the capture card really didn't get along with it, and especially because of the way mine is obviously modified. You have both a PAL and NTSC signal being output at the same time. It's just a case full of nightmares and pointing a camera at the TV is the best option. We are going to do this a little bit differently to how I normally film gameplay sections. Instead of showing you three different games, what I'm actually going to do is play the Muppets Madness game, which is the best of the three I've got, from start to finish, and then I'll edit that down so that you get to see a variety of the different kinds of gameplay that the interactive vision offers. Now this elevator is going to, I don't think we've been introduced. I'm Kermit the Frog, and would you like to be Dr. Cough or Dr. Hiccup? Now press the red button if you'd like to be Dr. Cough, or So press we'll press the, the red button, button and be Dr. Like Cough. Be Dr. Hiccup. Nice to meet you, Dr. Koff. Now, you might notice there that there's a kind of static noise. That's because the game has switched to the secondary soundtrack. That's what makes me think it's some kind of frequency shift. You'll notice it a few times uh, in a moment when, is it Bunsen? When he says, Dr. Koff, it shifts again. There we go, that's the shift. No, I said Dr. Koff. Oh, sorry. And obviously the reason Kermit hiccups there is because the video has to go with both. It has to be set up for the hiccup and the cough uh, for Dr. Hiccup or Dr. Cough. I wonder if those eggs are elephant eggs, duck eggs, or chicken eggs. Dr. Cough, you have a good eye for Frequency shift again there. Press the red button if you think they are chicken eggs. The yellow button if you think they are duck eggs. Now, as you can see, there are two wrong answers there. We'll go for the right answer, because the right answer will obviously be the only one that has a different audio track. There you go. If you don't answer, or you give one of the wrong answers, it goes to the default audio track, which obviously says that you got it wrong. They're chicken eggs. You can see there are some yellow bars at the side of the screen at the minute. That is so that when you're fast-forwarding or rewinding the tape, you know where to stop for an interactive section. So that you can skip forwards or backwards to one of the games. And you can see to the left and right of the screen there, you can see the visible data portions. That's because, because the console has lost sync, those sections are now visible again. Whereas when the console has sync with the video footage, it will put a black mask over those sections so that the player can't see them. While you're watching, you can change your mind as much as you'd like. Are you ready to begin? I, I can't decide. Perfect! Remember, press the blue button for the soap opera and the red button for the space adventure. 
Now you'll notice that the this one uses overlaid graphics, so the TV screen there is an overlaid graphic. And yes, it is in black and white. It shouldn't be in black and white. Um, that is entirely because of the way this system is modified and outputting its video. But I'm sure you understand that the overlaid graphics would normally be colour. Now this is quite a cool little trick it's doing. Again, the video that's playing is playing exactly the same no matter what you do, but you can switch between this soap opera displayed in a TV, or a space program displayed in a kind of spacey background. And the video feed is designed to fit both the space storyline and the soap opera storyline. What's wrong, Gloria? I'm worried about the Glorb. Timmy? What is it? See, she wasn't worried about the Glorb. Not she was worried about Timmy. Ah, uh, oh, Timmy's our son. Oh, that Timmy. What's he up to this time? Oh, Captain, what are we going to do? Don't worry, with a crew like this, a ship like ours... And it's, it's daft. But it's actually quite clever when you really think about it that they've not only made a piece of video that fits both themes, but managed to keep the storyline similar enough but different enough that it works. And we're going to need your help, Dr. Koff. Beaker seems to be caught in a space maze. Use your joystick to steer Beaker. So as you can tell, this is going to be a lot more like a game. We've actually got to pilot Beaker's ship. Again, the overlaid graphics will be in black and white. One thing that is quite cool about this particular game is when Beaker's ship gets hit by a meteorite, uh, the audio track changes to be Beaker making a panicky noise, which is quite cool. So you see we have to fly through here. There you go, Beaker's panicking because we've crashed. There you go. So that's quite cool that the audio is even reacting to this. We have to press the green button to get past the meteors and the green button is really stiff. So it doesn't exactly help and you can only reach the moon when it's full so now we've got to stay next to the moon for a while until it gets full no come on beaker We're running out of fuel beaker we can do this Ah, uh, we didn't make it this time, unfortunately. Oh, what a pity, Doctor. You didn't get there in time. Unfortunately, Beaker... Now, you can see that the bottom half of the screen is currently masked using overlaid graphics, and we can see Beaker at the top there sinking into uh, the mud. However, if we'd won, the image of Beaker sinking at the top would have been covered with uh, a nice space scene while at the bottom we'd be able to see Beaker planting his flag in the surface of the moon. So it's pretty clever really, it's using the overlaid graphics to hide pieces of the video to show you either a win animation or a lose animation. Okay, it looks like that's all the eggs off this screen. Have we missed any? Stealing these eggs, are we? Uh, no, Fuzzy, why? Well, because if we were, then we'd be egg poachers. You can see the actual egg scoreboard there is part of the video. The four eggs that are on it are part of the overlaid graphics. I think the positions of the eggs of power do actually change on each game as well. Because I think I've had it before where there was none on the right hand side of this part. Obviously it can only put them where there are chickens, but it can change which chickens have eggs and which ones don't, so the game won't play the same every time. It'll play very similar every time, but still. Oh, Fuzzy, look. 
I think we're at the lair of the evil Dr. Achu. Uh, thank you. Oh, look! Dr. Lair of the evil Dr. Achu! Come and we're doomed! Fuzzy, don't say that. That's the last one. We got them. You are doomed! Oh, like there's the last chicken. Nice work, Doc. You got them all. Our chances are good for beating the evil Dr. Achu. And again, obviously, if we hadn't got them all, we'd get different audio. That's right, my fine furry, uh, my funny fine, uh, uh, my fine furry fizzy bear. So it was you all the time. You're the evil Dr. Achu. Gesundheit. Thank you. <laughs> but you figured it out a little too late, Frog. Now I've got you. Gesundheit. Well, what are you going to do with us? Enough zaps for my transporter ray and bingo. You'll be... No! Yes, I'll send you to Machu Picchu. The only things that can save us are the eggs of power. I hope we have enough. Now, before the evil doctor fires his ray gun, you move the joystick to cover the gun with the egg. Then press the green button to throw the eggs at him, okay? Now you have to fire just before he pulls the trigger. The game starts now! There you go, so we got him, you saw the egg crack. There is actually only a really small window of opportunity. I know I'm probably making this look quite easy, but it's because I've played this quite a lot while experimenting with it and trying to make it work. Although I've never got quite this well. There you go, I missed one. You saw it bounce off the gun. For each hit or miss, there is a different sound that matches. So either him celebrating you missing, like this, or him being annoyed that you hit. Again, you can see here that Kermit and Fozzie are talking at the top about how we won, and in the bottom right corner of the screen, you would have Dr. Achu talking about how he won and we lost, but obviously that has been covered by the bit of the screen that is the scoreboard. You were going up to the pool? Yeah. Now, if you want to hear what I think, press the red button. And if you want to hear what yours truly thinks, press the blue button. Kermit. I believe both Muppets games end with a song. Kermit, tell us the truth. Was this game fun for you? Well, it sure turned out to be so much fun for me. Everything was wrong. But you can hear the other one. Terrible. So Gonzo is singing Everything Was Terrible. Whereas Kermit is singing that everything was wonderful. Back to Gonzo! There you go, wonderful. One thing that's worth noting is that they are all singing about things that happened during the game based on the player's decisions. Because just like when you picked Dr. Cough over Dr. Hiccup, the game does remember your decisions and these can be brought back up later on, which is another pretty cool feature. Unlike the Action Max and Video Driver, the interactive vision doesn't appear to have been given any real marketing push which seems surprising given the high-profile TV franchises associated with it. However, this could be down to the 1989 buyout of Viewmaster by Tyco, who were of course launching their own VHS-based system, the Video Driver, with Sega, and who therefore may not have wanted to muddy the waters, risking both their product and relationship with the video game giant. 
As such, the interactive vision found itself in the toy category, where it naturally failed to find a home, and was unable to show itself off against other video game systems. Of course, with the imminent arrival of the 16-bit Sega Genesis, and similarly advanced NEC Turbo Graphics, video games were about to leap forward, and while they may have lacked the live-action video capability, at least at first, they more than made up for it with vastly superior gameplay, leaving the VHS consoles in the dust. In 1990, the release of Disney's cartoon arcade brought the final game total up to seven, giving it the biggest library of its rivals. However, this was a poor, rushed title, using recycled footage and simple games like a knockoff of Frogger. Clearly, support for the machine was dead. Remaining stock of the consoles were repackaged and now came with the new Disney game in an attempt to shift the final units. And these days, that tends to be the easier way to get hold of that last game for the collection. It seems a little sad that the interactive vision never really had a chance to shine. It was undoubtedly the best of the VHS-based systems, utilising the format in a far more advanced way than its repetitive rivals. Unlike those, it was capable of real gameplay and true interactivity, all backed up by live-action visuals and clever audio trickery. In fact, it's the closest we ever came to seeing the control vision. These days, the Viewmaster brand survives as part of Mattel, However, it's now a kid's virtual reality system for use with smartphones, and while it still comes with those familiar reels, or a variant of, they're just for the use of augmented reality targets, meaning that for the first time in its 80-year history, the reels are no longer backwards compatible with the multitude of viewers produced over the years. A sad end for one of the most iconic toys for so many generations. That's all we've got time for on today's show, but as always, you can keep in touch by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or even by supporting the show on Patreon. And, of course, thanks for watching.